Welcome to Mama Broad's YouTube channel, where I'm joined today by Agostina Lacarte. She's head of primary and the primary years coordinator at St. Peter's School in Barcelona. She has a PhD in humanities and social sciences, and she has been teaching in international schools for four years. She joined St. Peter's in 2019. She also lectures and coordinates the postgraduate degree in international education at Abbott Oliver University in Barcelona. Hi, Agostina. Hi, Jane. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation. Agostina, St. Peter's is a private school for children aged 12 months to 18 years. Can you give us a little bit of an introduction to the school to start with? Sure. St. Peter's is an international school. It's a small school that was founded around the 60s by a family. Uh, so it's a family business. And we have around 600 students, but we have 42 different nationalities represented in our school uh, between teachers and students. We are accredited by the International Baccalaureate Organization, by the Ministry of Education and the Generalitat de Catalunya. So St. Peter's is an IB World School. I think um, a lot of people will be familiar with the diploma program from the International Baccalaureate, but less likely to have heard of the primary years program and the middle years program. So can you explain a little bit um, the structure of the IB at your school? Sure. We have all IB programs implemented in the school. So um, the IB starts with a primary years program at the age of three. Um, it goes all the way from foundation until primary up to the age of 11, 12. Um, then we have the middle years program that covers the ages of 12 to 16 more, or to 15 more or less. And then the last two years is, is the diploma. We have in the school, um, the, the, we have implemented these three programs in the school. However, we design our own content according to the needs of the 21st century. So we have right now uh, a group of experts in different fields, economy, artificial intelligence, uh, et cetera, that help us or guide us with what they believe will be crucial for students to know in the next few years. So the IB is all about providing students with the intellectual curiosity that will carry them through a lifelong process of learning. How do you establish that curiosity? Well, um, sparking curiosity in children um, is, is the basis of all teaching and learning or should be the basis of, of, of all teaching and learning. And it's what we do in the school. You see, when they're little, um, the children are naturally curious about the world that surrounds them and everything that is around them. They're fascinated by the tiniest little thing that occurs. So what we do is we use that natural curiosity that the children have to start or to, to bring their attention to the learning. So just to give you an example, imagine that we have to teach a unit on, I don't know, um, Asian civilizations or um, electricity. Um, something that we, that we can do at the beginning of the lesson, just to spark that curiosity, instead of presenting a PowerPoint, you know, with a different information, um, we can bring a little bag, you know, and in the bag, we put different objects related to that unit of inquiry or to that topic or to that theme or bigger idea that we want to, 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 to share with the children. So um, the teacher will walk into the classroom with a bag and maybe leave the bag, big bag, on the desk or on the shelf where everybody can see the bag. And if you label it with do not touch, it's even better. So you leave it there and the kids go around and say, what's in the bag? Oh, I don't know. Can I touch it? No, 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 you can't touch it. So they start, every, everybody starts talking about the bag, something as silly as that, you know? And they go like, and, and then you start asking questions. So what do you think it's in the bag? Well, I don't know. And you start shaking the bag. What does it sound like? What do you think it is? Can you touch it? You know, and you start sparking that curiosity. You can sit on the floor with the kids in a circle. You know, and then you can bring a child and say, okay, you come, see what's in the back, take an object. And then they stand at the front and they pick the object and then go, wow, what is that? And then you start linking it to the unit of inquiry that comes next, to the Asian civilizations, to conductivity, to whatever it is. So these tiny little things are things that we do in the classroom constantly to spark that curiosity. So it helps the children, you know, like be fascinated about the topic and then they're there and it's easy. <laughs> Agostina, why is inquiry-based learning so important? It's a good question. Um, the digital revolution means that schools are not only not, not the only places where the knowledge can be taught. 
Um, today, at the touch of the screen, you can find information wherever you want and whenever you want. You have information at your disposal 24 hours a day. So the school is no longer that place. The activities that focus only on gaining information and regurgitating that information are no longer valid. With information, you know, with a clutch of certificates, you're not going to survive today. You're not going to go out there and just get a job because you got two certificates. But if you go out there and you know how to communicate with others, you know how to face challenge or adversity, or you're resilient, or you know how to communicate with people from other cultures, you speak languages, you listen actively to others, and, and, and you have good communication skills, then you're most likely to succeed in today's, uh, today. And can you give me an example of inquiry-based learning? Sure. Um, Yesterday I was in a class in year three and, and we walked into the classroom and everything had been changed. So they were going to do maths, um, but they didn't know. They didn't know what they were going to do. And they saw that the, ch the chairs were placed in a specific way. Uh, the pegs had been organized differently. The posters had a different pattern. Uh, there were things on the, on the board and everything followed a pattern, but the students didn't know. So they were set all on the floor with the teacher and the teacher said, well, how are you? They came back from break. Can you see anything different in the class? And the kids were like, yeah, there's something weird, but they couldn't, they couldn't guess why. So they said, okay, what can you see? And the students started looking around. So like, oh, I can see some things over there, you know, like some colors. Uh, and said, okay. And what is that? And little by little by questioning, they came up with the concept pattern. So I said, okay, what is a pattern? And then they did like their little talk, you know, between the two, it says, okay, 30 seconds, talk with your partner, what's a pattern? They talk and then they share. Um, when they understood and they could define what pattern was, the teacher said, okay, go around the classroom and find the different patterns. Where can you identify it and what is the pattern? So the students had like five or 10 minutes to walk around the classroom, looking for what they saw was different and identifying the different patterns in each of the, the objects placed around the classroom. So that's one little example for maths. Another one is they were doing symmetry, but the kids didn't know. So they arrived there and they said, okay, I'm gonna give you some pictures. So in the pictures, you could see a leaf, you could see a crab, you could see a butterfly. And then the teacher said, I'm gonna give you a little mirror. So with your partner, um, have a look at the pictures and tell me what you see and what you can do with a mirror. So the students started exploring. They didn't know what they were looking at. Started exploring with the mirrors, at, with the different ways in which they could put the mirror and what they could see. So after two or three minutes, they shared with the class and somebody came up with, with, with um, the idea that it was symmetry. So she said, I can see symmetry. Oh, how can you see symmetry? And then she explained, said, okay, talk to your partner for a minute. And how would you explain to somebody who doesn't know what symmetry is, what it is? And then they came up with a definition. And then they started um, practicing symmetry with different objects around them. And then they gave them paper and say, okay, how many lines of symmetry you can find? So they were doing maths, but they weren't doing with a book addition, subtraction, or the teacher just didn't walk into the class saying, we're gonna do symmetry, page book 10, you know, like find the symmetry of the following letters. It was all about discovering, first of all, what it was, um, building from their prior knowledge, understanding what symmetry was, finding symmetry. So in inquiry, the good thing is that when students learn about something, they dig deeper and there's a real understanding of what they're doing. It's not just the teacher and the students memorizing because with memorizing, they will, they're likely to forget in the future. Exactly. When you figure something out for yourself, you're much more likely to remember it, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this this interaction between the, the teaching staff and the students in this inquiry-based learning. It's really interesting. Yes, because the teacher is part of that discovery. Um, in this specific class, I was sitting there with them. I was not the teacher, but I was in the class. And I was sitting with one of the kids, with one group of, of two kids. Um, and we started taking objects and we started trying, you know. So it's all about trial error. What do you think? And how else could you place the mirror? And have a look at this. Okay, here you can see that symmetry. What, what if we change it and we, you know, and we see it from the other perspective? Is there symmetry? No. Why? So it's both of us discovering, you know, at the same time. So it's 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 very nice. And there's a lot of collaboration between the students and the teachers. So it works really well. How will this type of learning facilitate life skills, do you think? 
Well, my view of the 21st century is that we have to teach them all these skills and dispositions and attitudes that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, learning things by heart is not going to take you anywhere if you get it don't, don't get me wrong i mean facts are important and the knowledge is important but it's it's part of it's not just the only thing um in inquiry um you have to get to know really well the child because it's a very holistic approach so it's not just the academic success it's the emotional and the social aspect of learning it's it's the whole person and as I was saying earlier, um, when I went to school, nobody taught me uh, how to succeed, how to fail, how to face adversity. And it would have actually helped quite a lot today if I had been taught those things. We live in a world where, um, I don't know, today we're fine, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. We don't know if there will be an outbreak of a war, uh, if we're going to go back to lockdown or what happened with the economy because it fluctuates. So there is a lot of uncertainty out there. And if we don't prepare the children for this uncertainty or for what might happen in the future, we're not helping them. We can't expect children just to walk into society and have a job and be able to communicate and to organize themselves and to face challenge and adversity if they haven't been taught that before. It wouldn't make any sense. So if we want them to have a job and be proactive and we want them to face change and to adapt quickly and to be resilient and to be able to work with people all over the world, we need to teach them that because otherwise they won't know how to face those situations. And that's what we do in the school. Agustina, you've talked um, quite a bit about the way the school teaches, um, but what about the content? That must be just as important. Yes, indeed. It is very important. Um, the how we teach is as important as what we teach. As I was saying earlier, if uh, we're teaching students uh, to be part of the 21st century and to face change and adversity and different things, uh, we need to teach them the content that goes in hand with these things. Uh, we cannot be teaching the content of 100 years ago because then it wouldn't make any sense. The children live today and whether we like it or not, there are phones, there are tablets. We live in a globalized world and we have the conditions we have. And it's important that we teach them um, the content that we have today. So um, if we teach Asian civilizations, there's always, yes, we touch upon the history because it's important. The history is important to understand the present and to understand where we're going to in, to in the future. But there's always this comparison. It's not just learning about the past because we have to. It's learning about the past has an effect in the present and an influence and an impact in the present, but it will have an impact in the future. So we have, uh, for example, uh, units of inquiry like migrations. Um, it's something that is very current. We see it all the time. People migrate. So Something that could be more traditional would be, oh, let's have a look at why birds migrate or animals. But what about people, which is current? And we see it all the time, you know, people moving from one place to another. So through this unit in year four of migrations, they learn about uh, the consequences, the causes, the impact, the society, the culture, how things change. And it also helps them to understand the world they live in, which is extremely important. And what about communication skills? How do you teach that at the school? Communication skills are, are we have five essential skills, um, or the IB has five essential skills. We have research, communication, social, self-management, and thinking skills. And we have to teach them all. Every year, we teach all the thinking skills, but we have lots of sub-skills. So communication is everywhere because it's the basis of, of, of the human being. We communicate all the time and in different languages. So it's basically in every single thing we do. Um, we have lots of sub-skills uh, in that big communication. So it's not just speaking, listening and presenting. It means listening actively. You know, it's teaching children how important it is to actually listen, not to want to speak, but to listen to what the other person is saying, to listen without judging. So to listen to the other person, to respect their opinion, even if you don't agree with it. So we teach them to agree, to disagree. Um, we teach them that it's important to understand other cultures, whether you agree or not, you need to tolerate and understand that everybody has a different background and everybody comes from a different place. So they might think differently. So all of these are communication skills. We have many more, but just to give you an example. So it's, it's what I was saying. It's not just, oh, I have to listen when somebody's making a presentation. No, we have to listen actively and you have to 
criticize the work of other people from a respectful point of view and you have to give constructive feedback to your friends and you have to work together so if you're part of a team you need to you need to pay attention to what the others are saying and you need to contribute to your ideas and you need to think uh, you need to be proactive and you need to put into practice inquiry questions or so on Agostina, you're very passionate about what you do. Um, obviously, you love teaching, but what would you say is your favorite part of, of your work? I would say um, that the best thing about being a teacher is that you can influence learning in all levels. So it's not just being there for the academic success of the child, it's being there for everything else. It's so for the emotional and the social aspects. So it's a very holistic approach. Uh, as I understand education or my understanding of education. So it's very rewarding to to be there and support the children and see them progress. Um, I think it's fantastic. I can't think of a better job. I love um, how you talk about St. Peter's being kind of family oriented and, and how uh, community is so important within the school. I really, really like that. Yes, we're a pretty small school. So we have I would say less than 20 students per class on average. Um, and everybody knows the kids. Um, the kids feel that there is a very close relationship between the teacher and the students. Um, it's a very flexible environment. Um, it's a very cozy environment. Um, and it's it's lovely. I mean, for, 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 for teachers to know every single child and the children to feel comfortable enough to walk to their teacher or to talk to their teacher about not only the, the, the academics, but also about personal things and look and find support is, is very rewarding for us. It's, fun, it's fantastic. Thank you very much for joining me today and talking about St. Peter's. I'm going to put at the bottom of the screen the website of the school. That's www.stpeters.es. And there, um, parents can find out more information and they can also find out contact details. Thank you very much, Jane, for, for having me here today um, and to be able to share our school with, with everybody.